I want to get in shape, but I don't have time to work out. Have you ever said this before? Because I've heard it hundreds of times. That's why in this video, we're going to talk about how to work out with a busy schedule. But first, hi, my name is Ryan Treadway, founder of treadwaytraining.com, where we help busy professionals get more results in less time through online training. If you want more information on body transforming training and nutrition topics every Saturday, consider subscribing. The first thing to keep in mind when working out with a busy schedule is that we're going to value efficiency over optimality. Two of the questions that I ask with each new client that I get are one, how many days per week do you realistically have to work out? And two, how much time do you realistically have to dedicate to each of those sessions? Because I could write a really good textbook sound workout, but if it's something that you can't fit in your schedule or you hate and don't want to do, then it's not going to get you the results that you want because you're not going to do it. So it's a much better strategy to take into account your time constraints and your preferences and write the best workout program possible around those constraints. That said, the goal of this video is to help you make your workouts as efficient as possible while also making as few compromises as possible. These tips will be divided into four categories and I will timestamp those categories up on the screen in case you want to skip ahead. The first category is going to be tips for planning your workout program. Two is going to be tips for making sure you actually make it to the gym. Three is going to be time saving tips for weightlifting and four is going to be time saving tips for cardio. First, we'll talk about planning your workout. Tip number one, plan how many days per week you're going to work out and be conservative here. If you don't think that you can make it to the gym four times a week, don't base your plan around going to the gym four times a week. Be conservative. It's better to start slow and say, hey, I actually have more time than I thought I had. So let's add in another day. It's better to be conservative and then add in another day rather than to start out too ambitious and then realize, oh crap, I can't fit this many days in my workout schedule and then have to drop back a day. That's a mental defeat versus a mental victory. And mental momentum is a real thing and it can impact your long-term adherence to your program more than you think. Ideally, you would get at least two weight training sessions in per week, but if you can't even do that much and you can only go once per week, then do that. That's still 52 more workouts per year than you would have gotten done if you didn't go once per week. Two, base your program around compound exercises so you can train multiple muscle groups at one time. For example, a horizontal press like a bench press or a dumbbell bench press or a chest press machine or something like that, that is going to train your chest, it's going to train your interior delts, and it's going to train your triceps. So it's taking the place of three isolation exercises with one exercise. If you have time left at the end, then you can add in some isolation exercises for body parts that you want to pay more attention to. Three, write your workout program down or hire somebody to write your program so that you're not having to think about what to do while you're at the gym. Once you have your workout program ready, it's time to actually get to the gym. So let's make sure that happens. One, work out when you're most likely to actually want to work out. If you're dead tired at the end of work, and you definitely are not going to work out on the way home, then work out in the morning on the way to work. On the other hand, if you're the type of person that couldn't even entertain the idea of getting up one second earlier than you have to, then it might be a better idea for you to work out on the way home from work. And if you have a flexible work schedule, working out during lunch may even be an option for you. Whichever time you choose, make sure you have your gym bag packed and ready to go. Make sure you have your clothes in there, headphones, a protein shake if you need it, pre-workout if you need it, whatever you need in your gym bag, make sure it's in there and have it in your car because if you wake up and you have to take time to pack all those things, the odds of you actually working out on the way to work dramatically go down. And on the same token, if you're on your way home, you realize you don't have your gym bag and you have to go home, then the odds of you actually leaving the house again to go back to the gym dramatically decrease. Trust me, I know this for a fact. If for some reason you can't make it to the gym or if you just prefer to work out at home, have a pair of dumbbells sitting close to the bed so that that way you have to look at them when you wake up in the morning and when you go to bed at night. They'll always just be sitting there looking at you. Once you make it to the gym, it's time to be as efficient as possible so that you can get everything done 
in a small time window. A few tips for this are, one, don't waste time stretching. Some studies suggest that static stretching provides little to no injury prevention benefit and may even negatively impact the amount of weight that you're able to lift. So all you're really achieving by doing this is stretching out the amount of time that you're at the gym. Instead, warm up with the actual exercises that you're gonna be doing. You can do two to three warm up sets depending on the complexity of the exercise that you're warming up for and how heavy you're gonna be going that particular day. You can do 50% of your planned working weight on the first warm up, 70% on the second warm up, and 90% on the third warm up. Or you could do something similar to what I do on my deadlift warm up sets where I'll just add one plate per warm up set. So I'll do 225, then 315, then 405, and then get into my working sets. And I'll only warm up for my first compound lift of each category. So for example, if I do bench press and I warm up for my bench press, I'm not going to then warm up for a chest press because my chest is already plenty warm from the bench press. Two, set a rest timer and stick to it. If you go over your rest time, it can easily add 10 to 20 minutes to the length of your workout. When the timer goes off, do your next set no matter what. If somebody's talking to you, just say, hey, hold on a second, I need to do my next set. It's not rude, they're not gonna be mad at you. They understand that you're there to work out and if it's important, they'll wait. And if it's not important, they'll just say, hey, I'll just tell you later and then they'll go do their own thing. Three, utilize supersets and circuits. These are huge time savers and something that I utilize in some form or fashion in literally every single one of my workouts. Supersetting is simply performing a set of two different exercises back to back before taking a rest break. And a circuit is basically the same thing. You're just performing more than two exercises back to back to back before taking a rest break. These are amazing time saving tools because you're eliminating a lot of rest breaks. So just think about it. Let's say that you're gonna do a bicep curl and a tricep extension, and you're gonna use one minute rest between each set. So you do a set of biceps, rest for a minute, another set of biceps, rest for a minute. You do your last set of biceps, rest for a minute. Then you do your first set of triceps, rest for a minute. Your second set of triceps, rest for a minute. And then you perform your last set of triceps. So you rest for five total minutes doing those two exercises. Whereas if you were to utilize a superset, you would do bicep, tricep, rest, bicep, tricep, rest, and you're done. So instead of resting for five minutes, you've rested for two minutes. So you can see just how fast the time savings add up when you do this with multiple exercises. And there's really only two rules that you'll need to follow. One, you're not gonna wanna do supersets or circuits with exercises that are highly complex, such as heavy squats, heavy deadlifts, or any type of Olympic lift. So basically anything that requires a high degree of technical proficiency. So you don't wanna do those exercises in a fatigued state. So you don't wanna do those back to back because anything that comes after that first one, you're gonna be in a fatigued state. So it's gonna be very difficult to perform that exercise correctly. And the other rule is to not do supersets or circuits with exercises that are for the same muscle group, such as different types of bicep curls, or with exercises that complement each other, such as a chest press and a chest isolation exercise, or a chest press and a tricep exercise. And the reason for this is that each consecutive exercise is going to be less and less productive. Because you do one bicep exercise, it's going to tire you out, Therefore, you're not gonna be able to lift as much weight on that next exercise, and it's not gonna get you as good of results as if you were to do those two things separately. And then on the same note, if you were to do a chest press, and then you were to do a chest isolation exercise or a tricep isolation exercise, you're gonna limit the amount of weight that you're gonna be able to do on both the press and the isolation exercise, so you're gonna be getting less results out of that superset. Instead, you should pair exercises for muscle groups that oppose each other, which is called antagonistic supersets, so something like a bicep exercise and a tricep exercise, or a chest exercise and a back exercise, or you could pair two exercises that are completely unrelated to each other, so something like an upper body exercise and a lower body exercise. Number four, the last tip for increasing your weightlifting efficiency is to use 
rest pause sets. The concept of rest pause training is actually way, way too long to cover in this video. So I'm gonna give you a very brief, slightly oversimplified explanation. And if you want more information on this topic, then I actually have a blog cast over on the Treadway Training website, and I will link that down in the description below. The basic idea is that you select a weight that would put you right at failure for your target number of reps, and then once you complete your set, rather than waiting a minute or so and doing another set, instead, you'll take a three to five second pause, then you'll do three to five more reps, then you'll take another three to five second pause, you'll do three to five more reps, and then you'll repeat this three to five times. The slightly oversimplified principle behind why this works is when you do a normal set, the first few reps aren't really that hard. Thus, they don't provide much of a stimulus for muscle growth. These tacked on sets at the end of your initial set are keeping you right at failure. So in theory, you're getting three to five sets worth of muscle growth stimulus with only one or two of these clustered together sets. And there is some data to support this. Again, I will link down in the description below my post where I talk about this in more detail. Now we're on to cardio. Unless you have a cardio specific goal like running a marathon, we actually have a lot of flexibility when it comes to how we do cardio. When it comes to programming cardio for my clients, I'm typically most concerned with hitting a target number of calories burned and I leave a lot of the details up to them, their time, and their preferences. Since you're watching this video, you're probably gonna wanna hit that calorie target as quickly as possible. So for this reason, you're probably gonna wanna go with HIT, which is high intensity interval training. This means you're gonna be performing rounds of cardio where you go all out for a certain number of seconds, and then you rest for a certain number of seconds, and then you repeat this process. So you could cluster together a little cardio circuit, or you could do this with a single exercise. So you could do something like battle ropes, and then just do that one exercise for a certain number of seconds, rest for a certain number of seconds, and then continue. Or you could do something like burpees, and mountain climbers and battle rope and jump rope and then just kind of mix all of those in to make a circuit and then rest at the end of those. The two main advantages of doing cardio this way is one, you're gonna burn calories faster and two, it allows you to kind of make it your own and just kind of throw in different exercises and really customize the cardio. And the downside to this is obviously that it's very fatiguing and you may not wanna do it. So that leaves us with our other option, which is LIS, low intensity, steady state. This is gonna be your typical walk on the treadmill, walk on the step mill, ride the stationary bike, walk down the sidewalk, that kind of thing. The first and most obvious time-saving tip here would be to go faster. If you're on a treadmill though, you can actually go uphill at a slower pace and that's gonna burn more calories than going on a flat plane at a faster pace. But other than that, that's really all you can do to pick up the pace when it comes to hitting that calorie target. So instead of that, what I wanna focus on is cardio multitasking. What I mean by this is if you had a task that you needed to do anyway that can be performed while doing stationary cardio, you simply combine the two tasks. So if you're in school and you needed to watch an online lecture, just pop in your headphones, hop on the treadmill, and walk on the treadmill while you're listening to that lecture. Or if you're listening to an audiobook of some kind, then you can listen to that while you're on the treadmill. And this is kind of a limited option, but it can be useful in specific situations. And one last note that I wanted to cover is that physical activity boosts productivity. A 2011 study stated that health interventions that require a small reduction of work time do not necessarily lead to reduced productivity. On the contrary, production levels may be maintained and even increased, indicating an increased productivity since the same or higher production level can be achieved with less resource. And I can personally vouch for this as well. When I was in college and doing a ton of homework and when I was starting Treadway Training and doing a ton of work getting it off the ground, I would basically work until my brain was dead and I couldn't think anymore. And then I would take a break, go to the gym, work out, and come back and get started on work again. And I would get way more work done that way than if I were to just continue to sit at my desk and beat my head against the desk trying to figure out 
whatever it was that I was working on. What I'm saying is that working out isn't necessarily something that's gonna take time away from your schedule. The increased productivity from having taken the break to work out could actually be something that adds time to your schedule. Thanks for watching this video. Before you go, I want you to do me a favor. If you have not watched last week's video yet, go ahead and go check that video out. It took me three months to complete that video. And in my personal opinion, it is the best video that I've ever done. So if you've liked any of my videos before, definitely go check out last week's video on why I train. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you hated it, give it a thumbs down. If you want more content just like this, consider subscribing, or you can check out one of the videos that will be up on screen. You can also check us out on the Treadway Training Blogcast. We're there every Sunday at 3 p.m. That's treadawaytraining.com slash blog. As always, God bless you and your family, and we'll see you tomorrow. Boom, bing, bing, bing. Just go to sleep.